I find myself in a situation. I always ask myself, what would Jesus have done in this situation? How will he have acted? What will he have said? How will he have responded? In what way will he have carried himself? And that helped me tremendously. On many, many occasions when I found myself between the devil and the deep sea, I was able to locate something in what he said and what he taught me by the Spirit of God through those scriptures, and that helped me tremendously. I want to challenge you. You may not do yours for 12 months or 12 years, but probably do it for one year, and you see the difference it will make to you. You see the difference that it will register on your life. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, I read from verse 57. And the scripture says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. By the grace of God, I'll be speaking on the subject, this is one thing you should always do. This is one thing you should always do. Let us pray. Father God, we want to thank you for the privilege we have and the opportunity we have to mingle our voices in praise, in prayer, in worship, and adoration to your name. Thank you for your word and thank you for your spirit. Thank you for what we have learned since the beginning of this month. And thank you for the way your word has been able to plant itself in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you for the various speakers that have come and the addition and the, the insights and the and the, 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 the information that has been given to us that has brought transformation even up to this time. Thank you for the opportunity I have to be part of the team. Take the glory and praise. and let me to start in this area of my office and minister according to the ability that you give so that in all things you may be glorified. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of us who are parents, especially those of us who are fathers. And for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, Redeemer, and Lord, one thing that is very obvious is that one thing that God as our Father has in mind for us is that he has what we can call a burden. As a father, you know the kind of burden you have for your children. The Word of God tells us God is our Father. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's our heavenly Father. We may have athlete fathers. God's word tells us in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Matthew 6, 9 says, After this manner, therefore pray you, Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. When Jesus was here on earth, by the time Mary Magdalene met him, and he was on his way after he had resurrected to heaven. He told Mary Magdalene, he said, I go to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now, if God is our father, one of the things in his mind is that he has a burden for us. A simple way to define someone's burden is a desire probably that that person has towards you. One of the things that God has for each and every one of us is that he has desires as to the kind of life he wants us to live, as to the kind of person he wants us to be, as to the place he wants us to get to in life, as to the things that he wants us to do. He's got burden for us. When I gave my life to Christ, I asked him, Lord, what are the desires of your heart for me? What can we say are the things that are the burden of your heart? You know when you have a burden even as a parent for your children? You know how it feels like. And he said this to me very simply. He said, I'm going to state them to you if you allow these things to be central in your life. And I said, okay, sir. He said, the first thing that I have as a burden for you is that it's my desire and as it were my burden 
that you as an individual and your entire family live a life that fulfills the purpose for which I created you. I want you to live a life that will be a fulfillment of the purpose to, for which I created you. So from day one, God's purpose was always at the back of my mind. That I had a responsibility and a duty in order to make God happy. That I was bound to live a life, as it were, that is going to be a fulfillment of the purpose in his heart for me. Then secondly, he said, he said I wanted to have my perspectives on issues generally. I wanted to see things the way I see them. He said, because normally, ordinarily, humanly, um, men don't see the way God sees. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the prophet of God says, For the Lord does not see the way man seeth. And in Isaiah, you can see in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, he said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not my ways. And God said, I want you to always see things the way I see them. And that is quite a challenge. Because God is not a man. Man is not God. If I'm going to see things the way God sees them, then I have to see them through the eye of the world. I'm going to see money the way God sees money. I'm going to see relationships the way God sees relationships. I'm going to see commitment the way God sees commitment. I'm going to see loyalty the way God sees loyalty. I'm not going to as it were, as it were, see things the way physically, naturally, humanly speaking, I see it, or the way majority of the people see it. And that really blessed me. Then number three, he says, another thing that is the burden of my heart is that you will accomplish everything I want you to do on earth. You will finish the work which I am going to give you. Very many times, you know, after you have achieved a lot, after you have had the kind of experience that I have, one of the feelings you have is, now let that servant depart in peace, O oh God. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which that has prepared before all the people. But I always ask myself, have I really finished my course? I mean, you'll find this in Jesus' life. In John 4, 34, he said, my meat is to, my will is to, um, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. In John 5, 36, he said, the work which the Father has given me, he expect me to finish it. And in John 17, 4, he said, I have finished the work which thou given me to do. I have glorified you upon the earth. And by the time you look at John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. So, Along the line, I discovered that this is quite very strategic. I remembered when I had a crisis in June 20, 2002, when some hired assassins came to my house. And they picked me up in a, in a car, and they had four AK-47 rifles. The first thing I asked myself, and I asked God, is this, does it mean that I finished the work which you have given me to do? You remember, Apostle Paul was someone who also, when it was time for him to die, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So I was saying to God, I don't think I've finished too. Except you say I've finished. Because it's only when I've finished the work that I'm now finished. Or I'm now completely finished. You know, and that was one of the things that was almost my mind. And I was saying to myself, if for any reason I escaped this thing, it's because I've not finished my course. God's word says, I shall not die but live to declare the good works of God. So God told me that as the 13th. He said, I want this to be on your mind. I want this to be something you put and make central as one of the burdens that I have for you. Then he told me the fourth thing that I want to be central in your life is that I want you to avoid people, places, and things that are associated with foolish living. He said, I wanted to avoid people, places, and things that are associated with foolish living. In essence, he was telling me not to go back to the world. He was telling me, as it were, not to focus on the things that are associated with the kind of life that I have been delivered from. If the kind of life I was living before was the kind of life that I need to live, then there was no need for him to have delivered me. When he said foolish living, I now said, what is the meaning of that? And then he said, you know in Psalm 14 verse 1, in Psalm 3 verse 1, the fool says in his own heart, there is no God. Which means I don't want you as it were to associate with people, to go to places and to do things that are not the kind of things that I have directed you to do. They are not the kind of things that I intend for you to do. 
the number five. He said, the fifth burden of my heart is that I want you to live a life whereby you will receive and enjoy everything that Jesus died for on the cross of Calvary. Whether you know it or not, many of us Christians are wasting a lot of resources. Not because we intend to waste these resources, but because we are not really enjoying all things that are ours through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. In Luke 15, 31, that father said, all that is mine is thine. In Christ, God made all that was his to become ours. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 says, all things are yours. Psalm 84, verse 11, the Lord is the son and the shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Luke 14, 17 says, come for all things that are now ready. He says, so I want you to receive and enjoy everything that I have provided for you. I want you to experience it. I want you to live a life that is a true reflection of redemption provision. And so when I became, a, after I started growing in the faith, my heart desire was to have everything. Spiritually, financially, emotionally, mentally, physically, relationally, that God through Christ came to make available for me. But the 16 is what I want to talk about today. Because I was going through, I was going through the various things that God said at the bottom of his heart. The 16 he said to me is this, and that bears a lot of uh, semblance to, to what I'm about to share with us. He said, I want you to live a life that will bring glory to my name. He said, don't live a life that will not bring honor and glory to my name. Now, that is one thing that parents want. I remember growing up in my family of 13 children with six mothers. My father was a serial monogamist. He was not a polygamist. <laughs> A serial monogamy is somebody who at any point in time does not have more than one wife. But that one wife will come and drop two children and go. And now will come and drop one and a half. When I say one and a half, drop a child and get pregnant and go. <laughs> that is the half. And after that one is delivered, they will bring and say, this is the child. You know? And uh, I know one thing that all parents desire is that you will not live a life that will tarnish their name, their reputation. But a life that will bring glory and honor, salutation, and adoration to their names. I remember my father would say, whatever you want to do, remember the child of who you are. Don't bring the name of this family to disrepute. If you want to be an animal, be an animal. But remember that you have to drop this name before you become an animal. How many of you can, 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 can okay, I mean, except you're not out of Africa. I mean, parents have that body. And so God kept telling me, he said, I want you to live a life that will bring glory to my name. I don't want anyone through you or by you or by whatever you do or the place you go or the things you allow for them to begin to say, ah, look at somebody who calls himself the child of God. Look at somebody who calls himself a uh, servant of God. Well, and so that has been at the back of my mind. So I've talked about the body of God's heart. When you talk about in his glory, one thing we need to remember is this, that the glory of God is the place where God wants us to live. The Bible says, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, let your lives so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify. Jesus said in John 17, 4, I have finished the work what thou given me to do, I have glorified. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he said, as we have all received the gifts, so minister one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, is, is any man speak, is any man speak at the oracle of God, if any man minister, then the minister according to the ability that God gives, that God in everything may be glorified. So that is the place where God wants us to be. It's such that when people look at us, and when people focus on us, we should bring glory and honor and might and dominion to God's name. With that as a background, I want to go ahead and speak a few more in another direction. Now, growing up as a young Christian, there were so many things that God had to correct about my life. But one thing I knew I was very nasty about when I was growing up, and which was part of me because of the kind of environment in which I developed, the kind of names I was called, the kind of people that were around me, one thing I was very nasty about was my way of responding to people. 
my way of responding to people was so horrible and so bad that one of the greatest lessons I learned was how to respond. How to respond to criticisms, how to respond to condemnation, how to respond to love, how to respond in a situation of misunderstanding. Now, I had to learn that because whether you know it or not, the way you respond says a lot about you and who you belong to. And for those of us who are workers, the way you respond is so important to the furtherance of whatever has been committed into your hands. A lot of damage has been done in the body of Christ through the way husband responds to wife, hus- wife responds to husband, church members respond to pastor, HODs respond to their members, neighbors respond to res- neighbors. It's so important. It's something that we need to learn. It's not something that we are born with. It is a learned behavior. The way you respond is a learned behavior. It's a behavior, as it were, that you are now exhibiting, but which is a product of what you learn. Now, you may not learn it intentionally, but one way or the other, we pick these things up. And that's why I want to speak on how to respond to God. At times when we are dealing with ministers of the gospel, we think we are dealing with men. No, no, you are dealing with God. When you are dealing with your spouse, you think at times, oh, I'm dealing with with men. When we are responding to our children, at times we think that we are dealing with men. But you see, scriptures have to tell us that in all of these areas, we are still dealing with God, as it were. And this becomes very important as I will be speaking in the next few minutes. Let me first of all define what it means when they say respond. A person's response can be defined as what they say and what they do in reaction, in reply, in answer to somebody or something or a given situation or circumstance. What you say or what you do in reply, in answer, in reaction to somebody or something or a given situation or circumstance. And responding to God was one of the things I had to learn. Now, when I was in the world, I didn't go to church. I was not a nominal Christian. So in any way, form or fashion, I didn't know God. And God coming into my life was a different scenario. Having never dealt with God, I knew that I had to learn how to behave myself. You know, having never been, been to church, I discovered that I had to learn how to behave myself in the church. And it is one of the greatest lessons in my life. Whether you know it or not, let me say this to you. The way you respond to God will determine the way God responds to you. If you are not happy to, as to what you are getting, be careful about the seed you are sowing. Galatians 6, 7. Someone told me, he said, ah, ah. every time I pray to God, it takes long for him to answer. Because every time he asks you to do something, it takes the same long. Galatians 6, 7. Say, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man surrender shall hear it. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. He said, they that honor me will I honor. They that despise me, I will also lightly esteem. If you are not happy with the way things are, check. It is the seed you are sowing that is multiplied, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. The way you respond to God will determine the way God responds to you. Psalm 18, verse 26. He said to the forward, I will show myself forward. He said to the powers, I will also show myself powers. So when I was growing up as a Christian and I saw some of those things, I said to myself, I'm going to have to change the way I respond. Because the way I was responding to men was a different thing. And I know this is a different kettle of fish. I've never had to deal with God before. Now I'm having to deal with him. And having to deal with him, I need to be very careful. You know, at times people know how to behave in their place of work. They know how to behave in their family. But when they come to church, they misbehave. Because the church is not your place of work. The church is not your family. Successful accountants may not make successful church members. It's a different principle in the church of God, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, these things I write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. He said, but in for any case, I don't come. I'm writing these things to you so that you may know how to behave yourself in the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. I've seen successful lawyers 
who don't know how to behave in church. I've seen successful, successful people in the IT industry, but when it comes to church, the way they behave is just out of place. When they call offering, the way they pray is different. When you call for men's fellowship, the way they behave is different. When we make a demand on their time, the way they respond is different. Now, this is God's house. And it's so important for you to learn how to respond to God. Let me say this again. Another thing we need to know is this. The way we respond to God will affect the way Satan responds to you. People don't know this. Someone said, I told the devil to go, but he didn't go. Now, why will he go? Why should he go? Now, the way you respond to God will determine the authority you carry when you are dealing with the devil. Listen to these scriptures. James 4, 7. He said, submit yourself therefore to God. Then the B part says, resist the devil and he will flee. The fleeing of the devil is not guaranteed when your submission is not complete. You cannot avenge all disobedience when there is still disobedience in your life. You can't tell the devil to go and he will listen to you. Jesus said this. Every time Jesus will say this. In John chapter 8 verse 29. My father who sent me is always with me and never let me alone. Because I do always those things that are well pleasing in his sight. Now he now mentioned in John 14 30, 30. He says, lo I come. And the prince of this world has no place in me. He was absolutely submitted to his father. And so there was no way Satan as it were could obstruct him or, or hinder him or hold him down or hold him back. The way you respond to God will determine the way God responds to you. The way you respond to God will determine as it were. The way, as it were, they will respond. Number three, the way you respond to God will determine the way even other human beings respond to you. Let me say this to you. There is nothing like a tough human being. The heart of kings are in the hand of the Lord. Listen to this. The heart of kings, Proverbs 21.1, they are in the hand of the Lord. And he turned it the way he pleased it, like the cause of a river. But you see, when you are not submitted to God, or you are, not, you are not responding to God in the proper and the right way, how do you want him to fight for you? You cannot sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's way please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Whenever Israel's a nation disobeyed God, they fell before their enemies. Whenever Israel's a nation lived right before God, the enemies could not stand them. They were too powerful for their enemies. So the way we respond, have serious ramification. The way you respond, have serious ramification. But because of time, I want to quickly say a few things. Six things. Six things. Or probably seven. <laughs> About our responses. And I wanted to take this seriously. Number one. Because somebody is a Christian does not mean his responses are always right. Oh, he's a man of God. Oh, he's a Christian. That does not mean that he will say and do in reaction and reply and in, in action and reply or in answer when you make a demand on their time or their resources or their attention. It doesn't mean that because somebody is a Christian that their response will be right. I've met many Christians with nasty responses. I've met people who are ministers of various gender whose response are nasty. So this is not something that's automatic. It's something that is deliberately learned. It's something you're going to make a choice about. It's something you're going to decide. I'm going to give you seven areas where this response is so crucial. Because somebody's a Christian. Oh, he's a Christian. So what? Hi, ah, he's a Christian. Why is he beating his wife? Ah -ha! Oh, he's born again. He's been born again for 20 years. Why is he stealing? Ah! <laughs> Number two, let me go on here. Because someone is a Christian, does not mean his response is going to be right. Number two, because you have been used to responding in a particular way, does not mean that's the only way to respond. There are other options. There are better new ways of doing guru things. For some of us, for example, when it comes to greeting, if someone does not greet you, you will not greet them. And that is the only way you have been responding. But that does not mean there are no other ways of responding. If they don't greet you, what do you do? Greet them. Matthew 7, 12. As you want men to do to you, even so do to them. If you want to be greeted, what do you do? You greet. 
There is nothing that says that is why older people should be first greeted by younger people. There's nothing in the scriptures. There's nothing in the scripture that says the woman must first of all greet the husband. No. There's nothing that says the young woman must first of all kneel down the man and say, Good morning, the owner of my head, the, 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 the champion of my soul. No. Because that is the way you have been used to responding, does not mean that's the only way there is. I remember one member of our church told us, he said, you are telling us workers to attend both services. He said, my offering will not change you. I said, why? He said, I've just split it into two. I said, God will also split your blessing into two. Because you have been responding particular way, does not mean that is the only way of responding. Number three, because you have been responding a particular way, does not also mean that is the best way. That was one of the things that Jesus used to surprise those people. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, verse 28 and 27, 28, 29, 31, 32, 33, 34, 38, 39, you will find him say this, you have heard it has been said, but now I say. What was he doing? He was telling them, because this is the way you have been responding, does not mean that's the best way. He told them, you have heard, it has been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He said, but now, I say, you have heard, it has been said. Uh, don't, don't, don't curse your neighbor. I mean, uh, if somebody, uh, if anybody curse you, you can always get angry with that person. He said, but now, I say, so have this at the back of your mind. Because somebody is treating me in a particular way does not mean... I should feel treated that way and does not also mean I should treat them that way. Because that's the way you have been responding does not mean that's the only way to respond. Because that's the way you have been responding does not also mean does not only mean that's the best way. The way you have been responding is that you come late to church. Is that the best way? Hey, I live very far. No, no, no. Is that the best way? Is that the best way? Hey, you know, you know, you know, is that the best way? Pay your tithe once every other month. You say, I have a lot of uh, bills to pay. Is that the best way? Is that the best way to treat God? Who is giving you everything and all things? Number four. Because nobody has spoken to you about the way you have been responding. Does not mean the way you have been responding is okay. And nobody told me he's wrong. Oh, okay. The reason why they have not told you is that with all the telling, you have not changed. Even God at a point in time had to leave somebody. In Hosea 417. He said, leave Ephraim alone. My wife and I, you know, we've been married for quite a number of years. We don't fight, but we reason together. And when we are reasoning together, you can be hearing some things. Recently, we were just in England and... She was using this perfume. And I said, what's the name of that perfume? And she called the name. And I said, okay. He said, you don't say anything. I said, all I've been saying, what did you change? <laughs> the point, because, you see, <laughs> because you have been responding by gravity, and people are not saying anything anymore. It's not because what you are doing is right. They are just tired. <laughs> They're tired. Now, you see, if you keep giving us excuses and, and they say, do this, you give excuses again. Okay, okay, okay. So what you do is, okay. <laughs> Why are you not saying anything about, well, after all this, you have said this, what, what has he done? So let us understand this. Because somebody is a Christian, does not mean his response will be right. Because you have been responding in a particular way, does not mean that's the only way to respond. Because you have been responding in a particular way, does not mean that's the best way to respond. And because you have been responding in a particular way and nobody has said anything anymore, is that there is nothing to say. Number five. Let me say it like this. Be careful not to respond to God the way you respond to man. You know, it's very easy to lie to man. Ananias and Sapphira have been in the ministry of lying for so many years. But the day came when they took the sacrifice beyond the mosque and faced the church. And they entered into the church. And Peter asked them. 
Before the Holy Ghost came, everything was fine. Peter said, was this how much you paid? And they said, yes. Peter said, why have you allowed devil to fill you, to lie to the Holy Spirit? One of our leaders recently, I was talking to him, and he was just lying, was just lying, was just lying, was just lying. And the Holy Ghost was telling me, he's lying, he's lying to you, he's lying to you. So I said, keep quiet. He said, why? I said, the Holy Ghost just said, you are lying. Then he started laughing. <laughs> I'm telling you. I was so, it was such a novelty. I, it, was, it was just a novelty. He said, he said, I said, the Holy Ghost just told me that. Oh, he said, not a lie. And let thunder surface here. He said, it's a lie. I've already prepared it for you, sir. You see, there are certain things you do to man. But you see, you need to be very careful because if God is asking you, where are you? And you are in Benin, and you are saying you are in Atlanta, God knows. I watched a movie recently, a Nigerian home movie, and this man was, he told his wife, I'm going to Abuja. Whereas he was in Benin. And so the wife went out to a friend, and so they were strolling along the street, and the friend said, I think I saw your husband somewhere there. He said, it can't be, he's in Abuja. He said, Abuja. So he called. And the man, as they were calling, the man was picking the truck there. And they were looking at him. Then they said, ah, how are you now? My husband said, fine. He said, where are you? He said, I'm in Abuja. Oh. Ah, the woman said them, probably me too, I'm in Abuja. Oh, because I'm looking at you from... <laughs> Whenever a demand is placed on your resources, do you tell God, I don't have money? Whenever a time, a, a request is placed on your time, do you tell God, I'm very busy? We are naked. Hebrews 4, 13. We are naked and open in the eyes of God with whom we have to deal. Don't ever respond to God the way you respond to man. Don't tell God what you already know the truth about. He knows the truth. There is no one that he doesn't, there is nothing about you he doesn't know. Hey, I don't have money. He knows. One time we were building a sanctuary in Elori and I went to the Lord and I knelt down and I was praying and said, God, you are going to have to supply our need according to your riches. We need money to complain. God said, stand up. I said, why, sir? He said, you are telling me you need money. What about the one in your account? I said, it's my money now. It's... <coughs> He said, who gave it to you? <laughs> I said, you. He said, hey, that's the way I supply. Now, I've supplied. According to my riches in glory, into your account, to the church. Prayer meeting stopped at that point. No more prayer. I just stood up. My wife said, why are you unhappy after praying? I said, why are you interested in that kind of thing? Why do you want to know that? He said, because I know whenever you stand up from prayer, you are very radiant, you know, because you are so sure God has heard. I say, I'm sure he has heard, but the way he answered, it's not the way I... <laughs> yeah, I said, that's not the way I want it. Let us be careful in the way we are respond to God. Number six is this, so importantly. Check as to how you are responding and make adjustments now. I'm going to say a few things. Check how you have been responding to God. In the last one year. With reference to finances. With reference to how you treat your spouse. Who is flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. With reference to how you treat your children. With reference to how you treat the word. How you treat prayer. Because God is omnipresent and omnipresent, and there is nothing that any one of us is hiding. With reference to you who are workers, let me ask you the way you've been responding when a demand is placed on you above the normal thing that you are always requested of, how do you respond? One of our pastors was trying to choose between two pastors. He, want, he gave me two names, he said, But I only need one of them. He said, As you pray, I said, There's no need to pray. I said, I know what to do. I said, just tell both of them after the Sabbath that they should wait. You have an assignment for them. So after every Sunday, we tell them, please wait. You have, I have an assignment for you. And then we give them something to do. But there is this one whom he had eventually never made a pastor. And what was it? The way the man was responding. 
After telling them to wait, the man will wait for a while and then we come to pastor. Pastor, what is it that you want us to do now? Because I have to go home. My, 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 my wife is at home and I have to go and eat. I'm very hungry. At... Oh, do you have to go? Say yes. Okay, go. The man did like that for four weeks. At the end, I asked him, I said, who is it that I've not been questioning and I've been making himself available and been responding sweetly despite the pressure you put on them? He says, this one. I said, that's your minister. The other one is not. Your response says a lot of things about you. Whether you know it or not, your response says, action speaks louder than voice. Your response shows a lot of things. There are many things you don't need to tell me. If I just put a little pressure on you, the way you're going to respond. Oh, brother, can you take me and pick me? Ah, no. Ah, uh. Uh oh, you can't reach your... Mm. Mm. Now, <laughs> without you telling me anything, I know the kind of person you are. You don't want to sacrifice. You don't want to do a little thing extra. At times, I did something to my wife recently. I was home, you know, and uh, she said, what will you eat? I said, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So she went and cooked it, and she was about 35 minutes into it. I said, I've changed my mind. He said, you can't change your mind in this one. No. I said, it's my mind. I can change it. <laughs> so she said, she said to me, she said, ah, if you can change your mind, me too, I can change my mind. No. I said, go ahead now. So I went and went back into the room. And after about 45 minutes, she came with the food. He said, ah, ah, you this man. Now, you know some other women will not even cook anything. They say, well, that's what you've done. Okay, then. <laughs> but for five minutes after she brought it, I said, you know what? This is, you've proved this character. It's a test of character. When there is a prayer on you and you respond sweetly and warmly, it shows you have depth. And that you're not just very very out. So, I will expand point number six in a minute, but let me give you point number seven. There is no way you respond to God that does not have consequences. Let me say it. If God says, I need money, he said, there's no money, it has consequences. If God said, I need your attention, and you say, I don't have attention to give, there are consequences. If God says, I wanted to lead this group, and you say, I'm so busy, I cannot lead, there are consequences. There is no way you respond that does not have consequences. But let me give you this guide. After God spoke to me that these are the burden of his heart, he told me the burden of his heart, number one is that I will live a life that will fulfill the purpose he wants for me. And then the other things that I've mentioned, don't let me go over them again. And then I asked him sweetly, I said, God, I want, to give you, I want you to give me a guideline as to how he will be responding to you. I said, give me a guideline. Teach me against yourself. The Bible says in Psalm 25 verse 4, show me your ways. Psalm 27 verse 11, teach me thy ways, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my enemies. Psalm 86 verse 11, teach me thy ways, O Lord, and I walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Teach me as to how I respond. Psalm 25, 12, he that fear the Lord, him shall God teach him what way to choose. God said, these are the ways you need to respond that will make me happy. Number one, he said, learn how to respond in the best way possible. He said, by responding in a better way next time that you responded now. Learn how to respond in the best way possible. In a better way. The pastor asks for a gift of a thousand dollars, and you know you have a thousand dollars, but you respond only when he says five hundred. Next time when he says a thousand, you know what? Do the thousand because you know that's what God wants to do. There have been instances when we ask for an offering in church, and it's after the service is over that somebody will come and say, "Okay, sir, that is my own." Ah, what were you thinking about? Now, we taught them and we insisted that they should learn how to respond in a better way. Respond in a better way. Proverbs 4, it is said, the path of the righteous is like a shining light. Shining more and more. Try to improve the quality of your response. 
try and jack it up. Try and make it better. Try and see ways in which you can respond in a better way to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to the pastor. Respond in a better way. Improve it. We try to improve many things in life. Our response must also be one of them. Number two, learn how to respond quickly. One thing is that we want God to respond quickly, and he does. Isaiah 65, 24, before you call, I will answer. Why are you speaking? I will hear. Isaiah 58, verse 9, he shall call upon me, I will answer you. He shall cry unto me, and I will say, learn how to respond quickly, fast. Because that is the way you and I expect God to respond. Why do you expect God to do that when you won't do it? That is living a life that brings forth the glory of his name. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promise of God in Christ are yea and amen to the glory of God by us. Our life and living must bring glory to his name. Someone who learned to respond quickly. I remember in those days when we were children. You know, because my mother died when I was seven, so we had so many women pass through the place, like through a revolving door. And my senior brother and I, we had this way. Whenever our stepmom calls us, la one, la two, la <laughs> She knows she has to call about six times. But one day we sat down and said, if it were our mom, is this how we are going to be responding? So we reduced it from six to three times. La hello. One. La hello. Two. Ma. But you don't let you call. And she will keep calling until we respond. Learn how to not allow God to say something to you twice before you do it once. Apostle Paul was speaking to the Philippian church. Philippians 3.1. He said for me to write the same thing to you for me is not grievous and for you it's safe. There are certain people they are dull of hearing. Try and improve your response. Pastor wants something done, I do it now. He doesn't have to tell me the second time. My husband wants something done, I do it now. I don't have to postpone it. I don't have to delay it. I don't have to shelve it. I don't have to procrastinate. I have to show urgency, which is an emblem of someone who honors another. Before you call, I will answer. Why are you speaking? I will hear. Try to respond quick. James 1, 19 says, be swift to hear. Make sure you pick his word so quickly. I remember this song that we sing in those days. When he calls me, I will answer. When he calls me, I will answer. When he... I mean, you should, you should have that eagerness of response. If God calls you, how many times will he have to say something to you before you respond once? That brings glory to God. When you honor him by responding quickly. Number three, learn how to respond positively. Learn how to respond positively. Regardless of what people do to you, be sweet. That's positive response. Matthew 5, 44. It says, love your enemies. That's positive response. Bless them that curse you. That's what you are from. Pray for them that this family use you and persecute you. That you may be children of your heavenly father. Positive response. You see this in the life of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 9. When he was trying to pass through the city of the Samaritans. Verse 21 to 26. They wouldn't let him go. The other people said let's call fire. Let's call fire down. Let's call fire down. He said no. That's not the kind of spirit you are made up of. Sweet spirit. Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him water. In this way, you heap coals of fire upon his head and God will give you reward. I know a man in our community in the learning today is one of my very, very staunch believers. He believes in me so much. But how did it happen? This man in those days, we come on TV and see all manners of printable things about our church. In those days, we did not have a very good uh, projector. So whenever I want to project anything because the bulb had already been spent, 
we will now dim the light. So the man went on TV and said, in that church is a disco church. The dad gets a point in time in the church, in the service, when in order for them to, to do what they do, they dim the light. And they now see everybody can go around and pick whoever they want. The man will come on TV, lambast me, call me names. So I looked at him one day. I wanted to read Psalm 109. I said, no. Don't go and read it tonight. Don't read it tonight. <laughs> and Job 17. <laughs> I don't, you see, but when I, I asked him, I said, what should I do? He said, write a check for six months of his TV program. And send it to him. You know the Bible says in Proverbs 21, 14, gift that is given in secret pacify great anger. So I wrote a check for six months because I'm also on the same TV. On, on the same TV and my own time is different. So I sent it to him. The next Sunday, I called all the members of my family and my minister. I said, let's listen to what this man is going to say. The first thing he said was, I, I can't be bought with money. Oh. I'm not available to be bought. Oh. Then he started singing one song. Then I said, Timbaro, Tomaso, Olipa, no, me, de, one. As I was watching, I asked the Lord, what should I do? He said, rise the remaining six months. But that's what the Bible says. So I wrote the remaining six months and sent to him. When he got the money, on a Sunday, on a Monday, Tuesday, he came to my house. From the very gate, he was saying, no, I'm not the one saying it. Oh. It's what they tell me to say that I'm saying. You know, I'm not. Today is one of the staunchest people who defend me. When he started defending me, people were saying, ah, what happened to him? What happened to him? Biblical principles will get you biblical results. Evil will bow before good. The wicked at the gate of the righteous. Proverbs 14, 19. Romans 12, 21. Be not overcome with evil, overcome evil with good. Respond positively. Positively. A pastor's wife in the UK told me about the mother-in-law and all of that. I said, be nice to her, be sweet to her. She will not be around for too long. <laughs> I said, don't be offended about her. Bless her, help her. Don't contest with her. Just be nice, be sweet. And as she was sweet to this one, sweet to this woman, the woman I called her one and said, hmm. I want to tell you, my daughter. Hmm. Since you have been showing me all your nicety, when I went to our coven to report you, they said, for what good thing are you reporting her for? Whatever she had been able to do before, she could not. I was in the occult. Let me tell you something. There is a way you go to the occult and report somebody there that you want X and Y to be done. They will tell you for what do you want the thing to be done. If you cannot prove the case, nothing will be done. She confessed to this girl and she died in her hands. I'm not saying the same day. But they became so close. And the husband was wondering, what is the conspiracy? When they were separate, the husband was wondering, what is it that is happening? When they were close, he was wondering. He was wondering all the time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you need to learn how to respond positively. Number four, Learn how to respond well under pressure. There'll be financial pressure. That does not mean you should not pay tight. There'll be financial pressure. That does not mean you should fall out of serving in church. There'll be pressure on your time by your children, by your spouse, by your work. That does not mean you should stop being a worker in church. Learn how to respond under pressure. Moses never learned it and it was the negative response that he exhibited under pressure that was responsible for why he died before his time. What he worked for 40 years to see, never, he never saw it. Learn how to respond well under pressure. There will be pressure on us. Financial pressure, emotional pressure, physical pressure. All kinds of pressure has God to give you strength. He giveth power to the faith and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Second Corinthians 9 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards us that we have sufficiency in all things. We'll be able to abandon every good work. These are things that you and I can learn to do. Learn how to respond well under pressure. 
Number five, learn how to respond in the way Jesus would have responded if he were in your situation. I say it like this. Learn how to respond in a way that is pleasing God. Pleasing God is so supreme. There have been instances when I responded to someone and I asked God, was that okay? And God said, no, it's not okay. And I had to call the person, please come back. This was the way I responded. And the Lord convicted me and I'm so sorry. Because you see, pleasing God is, high, is uttermost. And others are so important in the eyes of God, just like you and I are important. So pleasing God is so important. Learn how to respond in a way like Jesus would respond. How will Jesus treat somebody in need? How will Jesus respond to a work that needs to be done in the church? How will Jesus respond to a demand on him by someone who does not have? How? You and I are the hand of God. Psalm 17 verse 14 says, men are the hand of God. Learn how to treat that work you are doing. As if to say, you, it's Jesus that's doing it. When you clean the church, clean the way Jesus will clean it. When you sing, sing the way Jesus will sing. When you follow up, follow up the way Jesus will follow up. When you preach, preach the way Jesus will have you preach. Whatever I want to go and preach, whether there are 10 people or 15 or 20 people, I still give my best. You still need to give your best. No matter what you're going through, you are going through it. You are not going to stop inside it. You are going through it. It came to pass. So for as long as you are going through it, something will keep you going. And that's the grace of God. Learn how to respond the way Jesus will have responded. Number six, learn how to respond in an appropriate manner. Let me say this to you. Those people that God has been merciful to, when they have opportunity to show mercy, they don't. Appropriate manner. Learn how to respond appropriately. When you are involved in God's work, learn how to respond appropriately. God healed you. So how do you respond? The Bible tells us the women that the Bible, that Jesus healed. The Bible said they had no other life. They were just following him. Luke chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Learn how to respond appropriately. Let your response show deep appreciation like what uh, Pastor Fadel mentioned about the person who was healed. Leprosy was something that made you untouchable, was something that made you not to be able to mix with people. Whenever you have leprosy in those days and you have issue of blood, you are supposed to stand away from people and be shouting in the Aramic language, Lamen, 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 unclean, unclean. And everybody was supposed to back off from you. Now Jesus healed you. A proper response is thanksgiving. I always say this to people. Many, many times we have short memories. When people are serving in church, they have short memories. When people have become blessed financially, their memories are short. God is a God who honors remembering things. Remember who you were five years ago. Remember who you were 10 years ago? You are talking like God. I was talking to Pastor God yesterday. There are some people when they talk, they begin to talk like God. And they are men. Me and me. We used to have a senator in our church. I mean, years ago when he wanted to ring the engine of his Volkswagen Beetle 1300. Not even 1500. I was the one who borrowed him 1500 naira. He has not returned it to date. So eventually he won the election and became a senator. And he started talking like God. So I said, hey, 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 stop. It's me. He said, I'm a senator of the Federal Republic. I said, you are going to, I thought you were going to say senator in the Council of Heaven. That's what I thought. You are talking like God to me, to me here. One day I looked at that and said, you are going to lose the election. And then you will know you are a man, not God. He lost the election in 2015. This is two years after. A member of the church who is now working as executive director in one bank of industry is the one who is now pursuing and trying to borrow money. So I told him, tell him to come and see me. So that we speak to him like God. <laughs> what am I trying to let us understand here? I'm trying to let you understand one fact. When it comes to responding, 
respond appropriately. Do not put on yourself what. Look at that's what killed that man in Acts 12. Look at the way he talked. After he had spoken, they said, This is a God and not a man. He took the glory and God showed him that he was a man. Be careful the way you respond to God. God knows who you are or what you have, He knows what you brought you out of. He brought you out of the horrible pit, out of the barley clay, and set your feet on a rock to stay and establish your going. That same God is still the God we are talking about. Be careful. The best of men are their best are still men. And then number seven, learn how to respond in a way to inspire others. Let me tell you something that happened in one of our churches in Ibadan. The pastor of the church the first Sunday in the year 2000, he sent his wife to go and call his children. He said, please go and call my children. And so the woman said, ah, you know, this boss will not respond to me. He said, go and call them. Go and call them so that they will come, so that we take picture. 2000, millennium. The woman said, ah, you know, you send somebody else to them. And the man said, ah, will I tell you to go do something and you not do it? The next thing was that the woman delivered a slap. Hot slap. New millennium slap. It's <laughs> bugger! The man, the way the man responded, he said, I thought you were a serious person. Then the person was talking, he said, let's continue what we are saying. When they told me, I said, that's very serious. I asked myself, if my wife were to deliver a slap to me in front of the church, New Millennium Sunday, after I've just finished preaching, will I say, I thought you were a serious person, but uh, yeah. I called him to a lawyer, I laid my hands on him, and I prayed. I say, more grace, more anointing. Another one that happened in England, in Peckham, I went there to preach. Sunday morning, I finished preaching like this. We went out. I was standing with the pastor like this. The pastor called the chief usher. Chief usher, come. I'm talking about responding. I'm talking about responding. Chief Asha comes to the chief Asha and said, he said, when Reverend George was preaching, I don't expect people to be loitering around. Why are you allowing them to loiter? I said, ah, daddy, I told them. Oh. He said, but I saw them loitering. Why? Five feet, two inches tall. <laughs> Pastor, six feet, three tall. The next thing that happened was like a movie. She just jumped up. Hey, bugger! He slapped Pastor. Pastor said, did you slap me? He said, yes, I slapped you. He said, no, how can you slap me? You can't slap me now. Go your way, foolish girl. I stood there. I was shaking like this. That is inspiring. For my chief watcher to slap me. And I'm asking. Did you slap me? And she said, yes. Thy mouth have betrayed thee. Out of your own mouth, you have condemned yourself. Your own mouth condemned you. And I... The man said, these, these people are very useless people. I was looking at him. He says, so what? Are, and I saw his face swell at the place, point where the slap was delivered. Ask your neighbor, what will you have done? Tap him. Uh, <laughs> that is inspiring. That's inspiring. <laughs> that is inspiring. To bring this message to a close, I want to share with us seven important areas that have consequences when you are responding to God. Seven areas that are very important to God. God told me this and I wrote them down. All of this happened as a young Christian. I just wanted one thing I needed to do. One thing I needed to do. And that's why I'm sharing this. You are a worker. The way you have been responding to invitations to meetings, instruction, the pastor say, come, instead of coming, you do something else. What do you expect from that? What do you think you're going to gain from that? That's disobedience. It's like the sin of witchcraft. It's like the sin of witchcraft. And it's punishable. In the same way, which used to be punished in the Bible days. When the Bible says, when the Bible compares something to something, and you know what one thing is that it's been compared to, the implication is that what is due that you know of is an indication of the kind of penalty you're going to get. Even if you don't know about that penalty. Seven areas. So crucial. Number one. 
there are consequences for the way you respond to God's word. When the word of God has said something and you do something contrary, there are serious consequences. The word of God is the most important thing to God. Psalm 138 verse 2, he said he has highly exalted his word above his name. When you know what the scriptures say and you do something contrary to the scripture, that is what is called sin. That is what is called sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is when the word of God says go right and you go left. When the word of God says, when the word of God says prove all things and hold fast to the one that is true and you don't prove it, that's sin. When the word of God says pray without ceasing and you don't pray without ceasing, the Bible says while well, we know what God's word is and we are doing something different, he said there is no more offering for sin. But a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation that will consume the adversary. When the time of service is fixed, 8 a.m., if you come 8.15, you are out of order. First Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done. How? Decently, not most things, all things. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. When you don't do that, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 13, let me read from verse 12. It says, hope deferred make the soul sick. But when desire come is the tree of life. Verse 13 says, he that despise God's word shall be destroyed. But whosoever hack to the commandment shall be rewarded. The word of God is the word of God. We can't revise it. We can't adjust it. We can't resist it. God's word is God's word. Forever, O oh Lord. Psalm 119, verse 89, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 152, concerning the testimonies, O oh Lord, I know you have founded them forever. How do you respond to the word? Either the word that is written or the word that is spoken. Proverbs 4.20. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Don't let them depart before your hands. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For their life to them not find it. Let me tell you a simple story here. You know the Bible tells us, be angry but sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I remember growing up, my wife and I, when we used to have our, our you know, just our, our uh, you know, sharing together, not fighting. We just try to clear issues. So one day after we have risen together, I was pissed off. So I carried my duvet and I headed for the other room. <laughs> Am I talking about you? So I went to the other room and I I was still very sleepy in the, the room before we started reasoning together. And then I could not sleep. I was turning and tossing. So I said, God, you give your beloved sleep. He said, if I give my beloved sleep, but there is some forgiveness in your heart right now. I said, why? He said, she already says, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry does not remove the pain now. I looked for sleep I could not get. Until I went there. Okay, I've had you are forgiven. So I went back. In two minutes, I was asleep. So I woke up in the morning and said, you this woman. If this is what you are come to do in my life, God will not give you. No man here in his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it. Very many things I learned. The post it is, you need to be careful how you respond to the word. He pastor says, this is what the word of God says. God said we should fast for three days. Be careful. It's not something to joke about. It's not something to trivialize and say I have ulcer. What you are going to end up with be more than ulcer. Because the word is quick and powerful. Jesus said if I have not come and spoken unto them, they have no sin. But now that I have spoken, if they don't do it, their sin remains. The word that is spoken will either judge us or justify us. Matthew 12, 37, by your words you shall be justified, by your words you shall be condemned. Number two, here it is. We should learn how we respond to God's will. 
not just God's word, but God's will. There is something called the will of God. Many people, when they get a new job, they think because there is a higher salary, it is God's will. Be careful. The will of God is more intricate than that. 1 John 2, 17, He that doeth the will of the Lord shall abide forever. I have lived in Ilorin for 40-something years. Why am I living in Ilorin? Why should I be living there? Why can't I live anywhere else? So many years ago, I made a mistake that probably you did not make. I said, God, where will you want, where will you want me to be planted? And God said, Ilorin. I said, I made a mistake probably you didn't, you didn't ask him. You just departed. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Abraham relocated out of his country based on the will of God. Jacob, who relocated out of the country because he had a problem at home, was told by God in Genesis 31, 13 to go back home. Look at your neighbor and say, may God not tell you to go back home because he... <laughs> you know, man... <laughs> <laughs> Isaac wanted to leave. God said, Genesis 23, 26, stay there. There is something called the will of God. It may not be the will of God for you to leave, leave Maryland. Some people think because I can leave a church, I leave it. I have seen people destroyed for planting themselves in soils that are not facilitated to the kind of tree they have. Every tree does not grow in every soil. There is a soil where you can grow. If you uproot yourself, you are no longer a tree of righteousness. Listen, Isaiah 61 3 to appoint other than the morning Zion, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for money, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven, that it may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. When I came here years ago to Pastor Gandhi, I had my doubts as to whether he was planted here. But after so many years, I have concord that he's planted here. I'm telling you this. When Jesus' house started in 1998, I mean, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, but look at what it has become. To my understanding, Jesus' house, DC, is still the biggest, the richest, the strongest the most committed lawyer, redeemed Christian church of God anywhere in the world outside the camp. Give the Lord a big hand to yourself. Come on. What I'm saying is this. You need to respond to the will. When the will of God is known to you, be careful. If you don't ask the will of God, oh, fine. But where the will of Paul says, among other things in Acts 20 24, he said his focus is the will of God. First Thessalonians 5 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When something is God's will, that is the end of all arguments. Be careful how you respond to the will of God. When I was going to marry my wife, after a week before I spoke to her, there was another girl in the neighborhood who had a better offer. <laughs> a better offer. <laughs> Physically, naturally, had a better offer. A little bit more, you know. <laughs> she happens to be from my town. The mother happens to be related to someone that I know. Everything seems to be hunky-dory. But I had already discovered and know what the will of God was. Don't stop smelling around. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after. Understand what the will of God is. And when you understand it, do it. Acts 21, 14. He said we seized and we started saying the will of the Lord, let it be done. The will of the Lord, let it be done. So, well, I had to come back to my senses. You know, the Bible said the prodigal came to himself. What that simply meant was that he was beside himself. After I've looked at those tantalizing offers. <laughs> God.
God brought me back to my senses. He said, do you want the relationship for the long run or for the short run? I didn't know what that meant. Because God knew who that woman was. Well, I got married and she also got married. Three years into her marriage, she died. And I said to myself, I would have become a widower. And I have to start all over. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's something called the will of God. A man wanted to marry a girl. I think I've given you the story here. Thank God I did not marry Helene. How many of you remember that story? You remember the story? That must be old Jesus' house member. Now, this man was in a church and he saw Helene in the choir. And Helene was so tantalizing. And uh, he said, he went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I've seen my wife. He said, Who's your wife? He said, Helene. Ah! And the pastor had known that somebody else was interested in Helene. So the pastor told him, Ah, sorry, you can't marry Helene. Ah! The man was heartbroken and felt that he had been cheated. That the pastor had a way in working it for somebody else. So he left the church. Seven years later, he had located to the UK. And he also married and located to the UK. So one day, this man was at a bus stop waiting for the bus to come. And there comes someone down the road. Gigantic, enormous, and colossal. Rolling down the road. And he was thinking within himself, what is she looking at that she became like this, Biko? And so she rolled and rolled through more tribulation. She came. <sighs> he said, good afternoon, sister. He said, good afternoon. Ah, brother John. He said, you know me? He said, yes. He said, where did you know me? He said, so, so George in Lagos, we are together. You? He said, you remember Sister Helene, the choir? Said, oh, Lord, my God. How wonderful is your name in all the earth. What is this? Ah. He said, thank you. I said, Sister Helene. <laughs> you know that kind of laughter? <laughs> so quickly the boss came. And people were entering. The woman, before she could enter, too much tribulation. Shoving, carrying the leg one by one. Eventually she entered. So he said, Brother, I said, ah, no, no, you go first. Go first. Immediately the boss left. The man knelt down at the bus stop. He said, Thank you, Lord. I did not marry Helene. Be careful <laughs> how you respond. The man had been bitter, but he didn't know that was the will of God. Number three. Be careful how you respond to God's servant. Please. This is important. Who make his angel spirit and a minister a flame of fire? People joke with God's servant. You may not like their method, but that is whom God has chosen to use. I'm telling you, I always say this to people. God does not choose the golden vessels. He does not choose the earthen vessels. But the vessel he has chosen is the vessel he has chosen. And there's nothing you can do about that. Be careful the way you respond to God's servant. A member of our church came to me on Sunday. He said, Daddy, I'm traveling to Lagos. I said, do you have to go to Lagos today? You know, there are some of us who think, you see, when God puts you under tutors and governors, it is for your safety. This girl says, I'm going to Lagos. I said, do you have to go to Lagos today? She says, no, I don't really have to go. If you say I shouldn't go. Some of us say, ah, how can he be telling me? Ah, eh? She says, that if you say I shouldn't go, I won't go. I told her, I said, don't go today. Probably go in the next week. She parked. She was in church. The car that was going to take them was waiting for her outside. Believe the Lord your God. You shall be established. Believe his prophets. And you shall prosper. One of our sisters got a job in Bauchi. She was going to go there. I said, no, don't, go, don't take the job. The husband came to me and said, uh, excuse me, sir. I want clearance on this issue. She has been unemployed for four years. She has a job in Bauchi. And you say she should not go. Then where should she go? I said, she wait here. That sister did not go, in, in short, the one that was to travel. And one day she came to church and I saw her. I said, ah, how are you? He said, ah, he said that before I forget, you know you told me not to go. He said, that car that left on Sunday, they had an accident. They were roasted in fire. All of them died. What was it that kept her alive? The way she responded 
to God's servant. Believe the Lord your God, you shall be established. Believe his prophets, you shall prosper. Don't say because God's servant is this, he is this, he is, uh, he talks like this, he behaves like this. I tell them, I said, you may not like my method, but you have no reason to hate me because I hear God. Oh. I said, and if you want to, I said, the same principle on which I will hear God is the same principle that I use in helping people. Many people have spoken. One person wanted to buy a piece of land. I said, don't buy that land. Don't buy that land. I said, don't buy that land. He went and bought the land. He built a house. The house is empty now. Why? After I built the house, and ever, around 2 o'clock, every night, you'll be hearing, I'm telling you, I just said, don't, don't do that. He now went and told the member, church, church members, eh, I don't even know what I've done. He wants to take over my life. He's telling me not to buy land. Is he the owner of the land? The land belongs to God. What? Now he's not taking that anymore. To sell the house, problem. To live in the house, problem. He now can't, told my minister to come and do deliverance. I said, I've never seen the Bible where they're doing deliverance for household. I said, <laughs> you can only go and live inside your own house. Do deliverance for house. Simple thing, simple word. We told you, you will receive. Blessed is she that believe it, for there shall be a performance. We should be careful how we treat what? God's servant. Acts 23 5. Thou shalt not revile the leaders of your people. Don't gossip about your God's servant. Even if he's 15 years old, he bears not the sword in vain. That was one of the rules God gave Israel. Exodus 22, 28. He said, do not revile the gods. Do not speak evil of the gods. And do not say anything evil about the rulers of your people. 2 Peter 2, 10 also says it. Be careful that you don't speak evil of dignity. Remember what happened to Moses. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. Aaron was 84 years old. Miriam was 83 years old. Moses was 82 years old. So their kid brother decided to marry a woman of his own choice. Aaron and Miriam were not going behind to gossip. Moses did not hear, but God heard. And when God heard, Miriam became leprous. The only reason why Aaron was not leprous was that Aaron was the only person who would certify Miriam clean. Or else he too would have been leprous. But as the chief priest, if he became leprous, Israel will not be able to go anywhere. So, what am I saying? They try to show by age. But God brought them down to size. He told both of them, he said, if there's a prophet, if there's a prophet among you, the Lord will make myself known to that person in signs and sin. And he said, he said, but Moses is not like that. God knows who he chooses to put in every place. One man came to me one day and said, he said, sir, the, the way you are leading us. I say, if you know better, God will have put you. But it's me, God put. He said, and you can, I say, you cannot remove me. Except I remove myself. I said, so be prepared to like me the way you are. Like me the way I am. And he has sat down. He's not very quiet. He quieted himself like a child that is wind. When I saw him before coming on this, I said, how are you? He said, we are enjoying church. I said, good. You have no choice. The kind of tree you are, that's why God brought you here. If you uproot yourself and plant yourself in a soil that you don't belong to, you will and die. Without any effort from anybody. Number four. Be careful the way you respond to every child of God. Every child of God. Some people despise somebody. They look down on people. The Bible says in Proverbs 14:21. He that despises his neighbor, sin it. Do you know that despising somebody can make you lose heaven? Looking down on the person. Huh? Look at her. Hey! Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Look at her. Hey! Be careful. That was what made Miriam, M M Micah, the wife of David, barren. And she never had a child all the days of her life. Her husband was dancing before God. And she stood there and despised him in, his, in her heart. And when the man came, said, ah, welcome, man of God. Oh. Hey, hey, the king of Israel. 
Look at the way you are dancing and naked in yourself. He said, I'm dancing before God. Who removed your father? And put me there. Let me say this. When you see people dancing in church, don't do it. Eh? This woman who have shame. It is you who don't have shame. Because that woman, she's before God. When you come to church, it's not a, the church is a dangerous place to despise any child of God. Hey, you know that woman? That woman that has one child like that, that woman that is always, you know, waiting for people to give up. Be careful what you share about any child of God. Years ago, we would have thought that vice president of this country was a commissioner. Somewhere could become vice president. And those who have been governors after him, he has not been governor. I'm answering to him now. And then, I saw first your last greeting. I said, yes, your head will touch the ground. The way you, you have to. Don't ever look at someone now and determine that that's far they are going. Be careful how you respond to every child of God because they are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Don't look. There is a guy in our church now. Every Sunday, he gives an offering of a million naira. Every Sunday. There's another guy who gives an offering of 500,000 naira every Sunday. These two people used to live in a non computer building opposite the church. When we were doing evangelism, we saw them in the building. We thought they were armed robbers. We reported to the police. The police got them and interrogated them. So they now knew that they were not armed robbers. They were only homeless. So we made them guards. At a point, my wife said, somebody who is homeless, be made a guard. He will carry the whole church and go. You know women, the way they think. I said, they won't carry anything. He said, ah. He said, they will carry you. So I... You know, got, got them, and then we decided to give them other jobs during the day, and then we put them on a salary. One of them eventually went to OAU, finished first degree, did a master's degree in international relations. One way or the other, he started doing things, doing one business or the other. He met some helpers of destiny, sustainers, and all that. Today, whether he's in church or not, 100 naira, 1 million naira, bye! If he does not hit my phone, I have to call him, where are you? Where are you? What are you doing where you are? I told him, I said, I may not see your face, but let me see your hand. <laughs> let me see your hand. Be careful how you respond to God's children. Today is what we know. Nobody knows tomorrow. Don't despise anybody. Proverbs eleven twelve. He that despises his neighbor is someone without understanding. Number five, be careful how you respond to God when you are under affliction, suffering, and problems. Don't let your problem take you away from church. Don't let your problem take you away from serving. Response is very important. Don't, because of your issues, become nasty. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you have sufficiency in all things. Look at Job in his affliction. The Bible says after all these things happened, he lost 10 children in one day. That is grief. He lost his wealth. He lost his money. He lost his wealth. And he lost his wife. Did she die? No, she didn't die. She lost her integrity. Lost his friend. The friend who should have given him succor in times of pain. They were the same people that were criticizing him. But what was it about Job? He said, the Lord has taken, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of these things, he did not sin. Neither did he judge God foolishly. Later on, like Pastor Fadel said, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job. More than the beginning, he had twice. Be careful what you say when you are going through pain. Job said, though he slay me, I will trust in him. At times, because things are tough and rough, we think that God is no longer God. Our light affliction, which are just but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, but the things that are seen are temporary. When you are going through pain, when you are going through stuff, be careful what you say to God. That is when God is listening to you more than ever. 
Are we serving God for things? Oh, no. Though he slay me, he said, I'll trust in him. He said, I will maintain my ways before him. Some people become bitter when things are bad. And the bitterness is what keeps us down, even than the situation that we are having to struggle with. The time has come for us to begin to respond well under suffering, affliction. There are many afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivered. One of the reasons I always tell my wife whereby I cannot boast of anything before her was that when affliction was going on, serious marital challenge. One day we were driving my car. I had the panel car. We were driving to Lagos and it was raining. It was raining more inside the car than outside the car. She looked at me and she said, man of God. I said, that's me. <laughs> she said, man of God. I said, that's me. Then she said again, man of God. I said, that's me. Oh. <laughs> she started beating me. <laughs> Frustrated. I told her that day, I said, listen to me. We reckon that this suffering of this certain time cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Today, when she says man of God, she's saying in a positive way. <laughs> she suffered. At times, no food. There's nothing we did not do. One day we say, okay, we we'll command five loads at So we knelt down. We, we had an op op boat that was dirty. We covered it. Father God, we agree. As touching this plate, that there will be food in it. We believe we receive in Jesus' name. Open. There was nothing. <laughs> so I told her, I said, eh. it was not that there was nothing. There was something. So let's go and look for Gary. We are going through all this together. God is looking at you when things. That is why I like that song that says, You are God alone. Before time began, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you, you know, some of you don't know what it's called bad time. But for people like us, we eat suffering like food. But the rest is history. I've always known that bad times will never last forever. There is no affliction that will last forever. It could be there for a while. The pain will be there for a season. But then the beauty will come. How many have I given you now? Your money has actually finished. Let me give you one more. Another thing you need to be careful is how you respond to God when you are disciplined. Some people cannot take discipline well. A worker is rebuked and he can't take it well. I know a woman who, an accountant, a church accountant, that killed a church in Atlanta because he could not take rebuke well. He was asking for increasing salary and the pastor said, No, we have so many projects. Let's finish this project before he called Iris. And the church went down, and the finance went down, and families went down with it. And he did not even bother. He also went down with it. Be careful when you are disciplined. No chastisement of this present time is palatable. But it hurts his benefits. When you are rebuked, when the pastor rebuke you sharply, according to Habakkuk 1.13, is so that you can be sound in the faith. I mean, Titus 1.13, so that you can be sound in the faith. Be careful when you are disciplined and people are advising you. Don't agree. What is it? Tell them it is not their life. It is your life. Anybody can cancel a woman who is having an issue in marriage. When it comes to your tongue, you forget the cancer you give somebody else. I always tell people, anyone who is advised to do evil and you do it, is not because of the advice, but because of what you chose to do chose to do. I remember when my wife was suffering, my wife told me, he said, this is my friend told me that what kind of useless man is this? He said, he's called of God. What kind of calling is that? Calling without food. <laughs> Recently, we met the same woman in England 
And my wife said, that's the woman. And I looked at her. My wife, when we were departing, gave her 500 pounds. I said, I feel like going to go and collect the money. <laughs> we need to be very careful. You see, the point is this. It's so important what I'm saying. The way you respond to God is so vital. Because there are going to be good times, there are going to be bad times, there are going to be issues, there are going to be challenges. There will be sickness, there will be issues, there will be lack here, there will be lack there, there will be delay here, there will be obstruction there, there will be hindrances here. In all those things, God is watching you. He's looking at what you are saying. He's looking at how you are moving. He's looking at how you are responding. Tonight, as I round up this message, I want to do something. If you will assess yourself, you know that some of us, in some areas, we are challenged about this way we have been responding. Some of us are not responding in a better way. Some of us are not responding quickly. Some of us are not responding well under pressure. Some of us are not responding well when it comes to responding the way Jesus will have responded. You know what I wanted to do tonight? I'm going to give a call. You're going to stand where you are. You're not going to come out. We are going to tell God that you are sorry because of the way you've been responding. And that you are going to make a change. The way you've been responding to your husband. Responding to your wife. Responding in your home. Responding in church. The way you're responding to correction. The way you've been responding to discipline. Some people, because of discipline, they leave the church or they leave a department. Because the HOD there tell you, why are you late? See, you're asking me why I'm late. This is America. You are asking me. Were well, you here when we founded Jesus? You are asking me. Why did you join this church? <laughs> but you see, the point is this. All of these things are very important before God, and God is looking. As I was praying this afternoon, God says, give everybody an opportunity to examine themselves and to turn their ways around. Because whether you do it or not, God is watching and seeing every one of us. And the sooner we correct things, the better for us. God bless you. Can we rise on our feet, everybody? I want you to bow your heads where you are. And say, God, I want you to help me. In terms of the way I respond. I have issues. The way you respond to the pastor, the way you respond to other church members, the way you respond to people behind you, the way you respond to instructions, instructions before God. As a worker, I know tonight was a worker's uh, emphasis, and this is very important because workers, whether you know it or not, the future of the church depends on how you work. Not just that you are working, but how you do it. Jesus observed how those people gave. Not what they gave, but how they gave. He knew everybody. Just like he knows every one of us. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my reins. And know my thoughts, if there is any wicked way in me. Turn me in the way of life everlasting. Submit to God. Father God, I come with your people into your presence. You know every one of us. There is no one here that you are not aware of. You know our uprising. You know our down city. You know our thoughts are far off. Lord, you know those things that have been obstructing us before you. You know those things that have been keeping you back from doing exactly what is the burden of your heart for us. You want us to live a life that will bring glory to your name. The way we have been responding shows our character and it doesn't show many occasions that we are Christians the way we should be. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Tonight, if you know that you need to make any amendment in any way you have been responding, I want you to put your hand on your chest. As a man, as a woman, as a worker, as an employer, as an employee, as a church member, you know that I need to make amends. I don't respond quickly enough. I don't respond positively. I don't. I don't respond in an inspiring way. When people see me when I respond around me, they don't want to be like me. 
I don't respond the way Jesus will have responded, but God help me tonight. Talk to God from the bottom of your heart. Talk to God from the bottom of your heart. And tell him to help you. We all need help. With one thing or the other, there's nobody who does not need help. We all need help in one area or the other. There's nobody who does not need help in one area or the other. This is help coming. This could just be the issue. This could just be the cog in the wheel of progress. This could just be what God has been having a problem with. A little amendment, a little adjustment, a little restructuring would change everything. I know what it is when God has told me sometimes you are not responding well. Say the way you are responding is not good enough. I wouldn't respond like that. I wouldn't behave like that. God told me one time, say, I wouldn't behave like that. He said, yes, you claim to have my spirit and look at the way you are responding. He said, I wouldn't do that. Tell God to help right now. Tell God to have mercy on you. I'm going to pray a general prayer. Tell God to help you in that area. It could be the way you respond to your pastor in church. You involve yourself in our wholesome activities. You talk. You make comments. Sometimes mockery. Sometimes you say, I don't, even want, I don't even understand. Why? You don't have to understand many things. Many things I don't understand. Many things we will never understand. Precious Father, help us to amend our ways. Father God, I come into your presence with your people tonight. No one can say I am someone who does not need a change. On this side of eternity, we will always make, need to make amendments. Thank you for the spirit of humility that have made people respond and made them open and made them say yes. I need to check that area. And Father, in as much as they have desired to, let the power of your spirit open their hearts to them. Let them see. Let them know. Let them comprehend every adjustment that they need to make. Let no one leave this place today, Father, in the name of Jesus. Without making the amendment they need to make, help them by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> To make this um, adjustment easy and simple and yet very effective in the name of Jesus. Lord, come down to the level of understanding and speak to us. Mundane things like coming late. Mundane things like not telling the truth. Mundane things like giving excuses when our, our attentions are required. Mundane things like Telling, saying, what about the other person? What about this other person? Mundane things like that have kept us back from you. And the best you have and the burden you have in your heart. Father God, help every one of us. Including the speaker. Including me, the speaker. Help every one of us, oh God. So that in that area with reference to that thing that has been obstructing, hindering and holding us down. Thy yoke, let it be broken in the name of Jesus. That thing the enemy has been using, mentioning, accusing us of before your throne. That tormenting, repetitive thing the devil has been using to try to pull us down before you. Lord, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, give us the ability to gain ascendancy, to gain control, to gain rulership, over these obstructive forces in the name of Jesus. Thank you for a change of heart. Thank you for a new day. We glorify you and exalt you. Because as we leave this place today, let something new begin to happen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Shall we be seated?